Good evening, participants. Volatility is something changes rapidly and unpredictably. As market is facing geopolitical issues on Russia and Ukraine standoff for well over a month, Fed Reserve is going to raise interest rates because of unprecedented inflation in the US, which is at 40 year high. The FIAs are pulling out close to about 14 billion USD in the last three months, made the market volatile. In these uncertain times, how to navigate volatility is the biggest challenge for the fund manager. Mr. Rajesh Kothari of Alpha Accurate Advisors is one of the respected fund managers with over about 25 years of experience. And earlier he was, he was with DSP Merrill Lynch and he served there with distinction. He has invented and executed a unique and resilient uh, portfolio strategy for superior risk adjusted returns for well over a decade. He can be regularly seen on all major business televisions and Mr. Rajesh's enthusiasm is infectious in a positive manner. Now I hand over the stage to Mr. Rajesh to present the strategy. After that, uh, we will take q and Thank you, Sri Raman. Thank you for your kind introduction. Um, thank you, PMS Bazaar. Thank you, Paytm, uh, for giving us an opportunity uh, to present on this platform. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this is a, today is the first day of the new financial year, and uh, uh, you know I have a little smile on my face because uh, at least on the first day, the beginning of the year, the market has ended in a on a positive note. Friends, last three months we have seen different kind of a volatility, probably for a different kind of reasons. The volatility in the market in the recent times created by Russia Ukraine issues, the geopolitical tensions. And you know, whenever any such event happens, there is obviously a lot of anxiety, a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, you know, kind of a noise that happens in the market. But it is not probably the first time, just before the U Ukraine COVID, uh, you know, Russia crisis, we had COVID crisis. Before COVID crisis, we had a INFS credit crisis. Before Ireland of credit crisis, we had a Middle East crisis. Before Middle East crisis, we had a Lemon crisis. Before Lemon crisis, we had a other kind of geopolitical crisis, and so on and so forth. So I always say that volatility is the nature of the market. You can't skip the volatility. And that's how the equity markets are equity. If volatility would not have been there, equity market would have been worked like a fixed deposit. Every day just keeps moving up 0 0.1, 0 0.1, 0 0.1, but that's not how equity market works. The nature of equity market is volatility. The ups and downs, they are the regular part, they are the normal part of the market. So in this kind of a volatile market, I, I was talking with one of the conference you know, a few months back and I said that the world is becoming more book world, more volatility, more uncertainty, more complexity, and more ambiguity. And the Speed of volatility is increasing every day. That's the difference. 20 years back, the speed was different. Today, the speed is different. And with volatility, you see significant changes in the underlying sectoral outlook, significant changes in the underlying corporate earnings growth. And therefore, you also need to make the similar changes at your portfolio level, because if you don't, then I strongly believe that in long term, we all are dead, you know. So you need to make sure that your strategy, your portfolio, your investments are relevant for day. That's something very important. You know, it is like 1900 automobile industry. There was no automobile industry. It was like a horse carts. And if my memory serves me right, probably even in the first world war, the automobile was not used much. It was horse cards during the First World War. And in only 1918 or 1920, slowly, steadily, as the automobile gained the acceptance, the horse cards started declining and then automobile industry took its turn. So nothing is permanent. There might be two year cycle, it might be five year cycle, it might be 50 year cycle, it might be 100 year cycle, but nothing is permanent. So with that opening remark, 
Uh, friends, let me share with you a uh, very small, uh, crunchy kind of a presentation. Uh, I'm, I'll try to make it as simple as possible uh, to keep it like a you know, very lemons kind of a language. Give me one moment while I share my screen. Before I uh, you know, go about the presentation, just two lines uh, about Alpha Accurate Advisors. Uh, you know, so we have a portfolio management and investment advisory. Uh, we are probably one of the few firms which started much early in the game. So I started PMS in 2009. So now we have 12 years of award-winning performance. Risk management is something very important, which we believe. We strongly believe that buying right is only one part of strategy. You also need to sell right. So we have very, very disciplined exit strategy apart from the right stock selection. And in the last 12 years, we have delivered about 20% compounded annualized returns. With that brief note, let me take you through how one should navigate this volatility. And I've divided this presentation in five parts. What is happening in the market? Importance of sticking to your financial plan. How to avoid common pitfalls. What one should do right now. What you should do right now. And last but not least, how can Alpha Credit Advisors, AAA, how can we help you? So friends, if I look at the Ukraine-Russia war, there are three different scenarios. The scenario one, let's assume the resolution comes probably in next few months. Second scenario, resolution is very late. It may take more than three, five, six months and extends to almost like 12 months. And the worst case scenario, it is not only it gets prolonged, but at the same time, the Russia plays a small seat in terms of the energy supply. And each of these different scenarios are given the three fundamental impact which it can have on the economy and therefore directly or indirectly to corporate earnings. Under the first scenario, if the resolution happens very quickly, inflation may be a little bit higher than where we are today, not that bad. Interest rates also a little bit higher, not that bad. And GDP growth risk, I don't see significant risk to GDP. Under the second scenario, rates resolution, inflation impact can be moderate high, Interest rate also, therefore, can go up a little bit more than what street is right now thinking. And there is a marginal, moderate, negative impact on the GDP growth. Of course, the last senior is the worst senior because in that case, the Russia also plays a small spot and therefore, it can have a significant damage to GDP because inflation will go up skyrocketing high and therefore, interest rate will also move up and then surely it is not good for equity as an asset class. Now, when I'm talking about these three scenarios, we also need to keep in mind that it's just not only about the war, it is also about the Western countries' policy or for sanctions on Russia. So say, for example, if within one month, Russia, for example, does either moves out or takes control of Ukraine, and then also enters into an amicable solution with European countries and US from sanctions perspective, then that's good news. But think of a scenario where Russia, for example, withdraws or takes control, and US says that sanctions will continue what is announced today, both by European uh, nation and the United States. Then even if the war is over, the economic impact is not over. So these are the three scenarios. I'm just trying to put life very simple. Three scenarios, one doesn't know the probability, uh, but generally speaking, scenario one is more likelihood, and scenario three is the least likelihood. Is it the first time? When it's such kind of war, is it first time? No, don't worry about it beyond a point. Why? We have seen the number of events in last 30, 40 years of India equity market history. Whether you take 1986, Libya bombing, whether you take 1991, first Gulf War, 1999, Kosovo bombing, 1999, Kargil warning, 2001, 9-11, very famous. 2003, Iraq attack. And last but not least, the Syria conflict. If I look at these events, the average drawdown is 10%. Maximum drawdown is 22%. And roughly, it takes 38 average days 
for market to come back from where it started the fall. Believe it or not, this slide I made it on first March in our Triple Insights newsletter, and on twenty ninth March, exactly roughly about thirty five days, Sensex recovered the entire loss. The decline was actually at Z ten percent from the peak on twenty second February. Russia announced the invasion in Ukraine. and from that day it went down to 10% just mirroring last average history of last 40 years and exactly in 35 working days it recovered its complete losses and it is now back to where it was before the announcement of the war so what i'm trying to say is that nothing is new sometimes countries are different the reasons might be different pandemic can be Ebola can be influenza, can be COVID, and we all get worried. You know, there's a stampede in minds of investors. What is going to happen? What next? Headlines of newspapers, media channels makes you further confused and lot of noise. Everybody is worried. Morning news are different, evening news are different, and next day morning news are completely different. Very very volatile. Very important in such volatile market. We don't forget. that this is not first time there is nothing called this time is different time repeats itself learn from past and learn from it and implement to the extent possible keep cool and calm mind something very important in indian equity market or for the better any asset class uh, anywhere in the world how to avoid the common pitfalls generally speaking whenever such events happens i am not talking about the Investor behavior related lectures where people talk about don't panic and you know all that stuff. I'm not going into it. I'm going into absolutely fundamentals. What a fund manager, what a serious investor always look for whenever any event happens, whether it is a COVID, whether it is a supply chain shock, whether it is an oil price increase, whether it is a Russia Ukraine, any such events. Three important things: inflation, interest rates, and this to combine. resulting into the higher volatility because fear of inflation fear of interest rate without understanding much of what is beneath is something very very important let me break few myths of higher inflation is it good or is it bad and let me answer you in one slide friends this is slide from 1993 to 2022 you can see the two lines here the left hand line is corporate profit to gdp higher number is better right axis is inflation and generally people believe that high inflation is bad but in my view and if you look at this chart as well the inflation is not bad the moderate inflation is in fact very good inflation and look at this chart from 2003 to 2006 I don't know how many investors in this conference participated in that golden period of Indian bull market. Sensex became five times in five years, and during that time, what happened? The inflation actually moved up, and as inflation moved up, the corporate profit also moved up, and as corporate profit moved up, market also moved up. But of course, if the interest, if the inflation goes up beyond a point, as it crosses eight percent, nine percent, ten percent. that is a dangerous signal and then corporate profit to gdp comes down and the market also comes down so moderate inflation is a high inflation is good inflation it is like cholesterol you know low cholesterol ldh and hdh so some inflation is good inflation some inflation hyperinflation is very bad for the market so don't get confused don't use the common parlance that inflation is bad for equity no inflation is not bad for equity hyperinflation is bad for economy hyperinflation is bad for equity moderate inflation is good for economy moderate inflation is good for equity market let me go to the second most important fear in the minds of investor what if the fed rate increases the interest rates much beyond what one is thinking okay let me put this chart in front of you 2004 to 2006 you look at this line the fed rate kept moving up 
and look at the Nifty. Nifty delivered 95% returns despite Fed debt increasing from 1% to 4.86%. So this is not the first time that Fed is going to increase its rate. From 2000 to 2022, there were two cycles where Fed increases rate. And from 1% to 5% is a huge jump. And market delivered you how much percent? 95%, almost, nearly almost doubled in that time, despite Fed increasing interest rate. Let me give you a second important cycle, 2015 to 2018. Here also, if you look at it, Fed debt moved up from 0.5 to 2.5, and Nifty delivered 36% return, absolute terms I'm talking about during that period. Why? Because, as I said, little bit inflation, little bit interest rate is actually good for the economy. Negative inflation, negative interest rate is bad for economy. If the inflation moves up and if the interest rate moves up to a certain extent, it means the economy is growing. And as the economy grows, the demand is improving. As the demand is improving, there is a credit growth is improving. As the credit growth is improving, there is a more demand for the loans. As there is a more demand for loans, and as there is an inflation, the interest rate moves up. So interest rate is moving up, the inflation is moving up because of the improvement in demand. And that is the reason why market moves up. But if it goes up to a level which has become unaffordable, then demand reduces, and as the demand reduces, the market also gives you negative returns. So hyperinflation is bad, hyperinterest rates are bad. Let me give you this very important slide to you. What was the behavior of market pre-interest rate hikes and post-interest rate hikes? Little bit technical slide, but very, very interesting insights you will get from this. This is a line, and if you look at on the left side of this vertical line, how many months before, what was the market behavior? This is a date of announcement, the zero line, and what was the market behavior after the announcement? And as you can see, six months after the announcement, market went up. Nine months after the announcement, market went up. 12 months after the announcement, market went up. 24 months after announcement, market went up. Markets are smarter than what you and me probably can think of. And therefore, market witnessed correction before the actual announcement. And that's exactly happened even during this time. Market went down during those early months from January onwards. If you look at the Dow Jones, if you look at S&P 500, they started coming under pressure. It bottomed, and in the month of March, Fed rate hike came, and from that date actually, market started moving up because the worst is probably factored into. So, friends, very important thing: volatility is normal. And here I am trying to give you last. 30 years examples. And look at this every calendar year. Every year, look at the red spot. Red spot is a drawdown, that's negative return. Market went down almost every year, except few years where it didn't went down at all. But in most of the years, it declined by 10%, 20%, 26%, 13%, 25%, 35%, 9%, 9%, and so on and so forth. The declines are normal. And in the same way, market also went up every year, high point, 80%, 30%, 60%, 70%, 15%, 25%. So if you invest at any given point of time, from that day, for the next 12 months, from that day, market may go up 20%, market can go down 20%. It's absolutely normal. Don't get worried about it. When you are making an investment, Keep that line very clear that volatility is normal. Be prepared. Accept the volatility. Don't worry about the volatility. Don't get away from the volatility because that's the nature. And you can't skip the nature. If you want to make long-term wealth creation, volatility, you have to accept with wholeheartedly. The welcome volatility. Because volatility gives you opportunity. Volatility gives you an advantage. So five things you can do right now. Five things you can do right now. First, take advantage of volatility. Second, 
time in the market is more important than timing the market don't try to time the market people will say i have sold at the peak and i bought at the bottom it happens only in stories in real life it doesn't work like that number 3 invest consistently even during bad times don't worry in bad times also you should keep investing don't withdraw if you are making systematic investment plan or if you have a financial goal stick to it focus on long term very important don't focus on 3 months 6 months 9 months don't focus on tick based investment and last but not least consider a hands off approach if you are competent do investments on your own and if you are not take a help of financial advisor like pms bazaar or any such good advisor take a help of the good professional fund managers maybe alpha through advisor maybe somebody else that's fine but have a hands off approach i cannot be doctor of every field i might be doctor of only one field and therefore i should not try to do experiment because moment i do experiment you need to pay tuition fees and at times tuition fees are very very expensive believe me many of investors of current existing pms investors all here they were doing on their own including derivatives futures option hedging and of course they lost in a big way and then they realize it is not their cup of tea because they are either working somewhere or they are doing their own business an equity market is a 24 by 7 job because world is becoming more and more volatile every day i said time in the market is more important than timing the market why and this is a beautiful chart i'm sure many of you might have seen this chart before in one or other form from 2009 if you would have remain invested 2009 till 31 december 2021 your 1 crore would have became 6 crores 500 percent return now there are people who say that okay what if i can time the market friends you cannot time the market if you don't miss the five best days just five best days your 500 percent return will come down to 296 percent return just five best days If you have missed ten best days, returns would have down further to only two hundred percent. And if you have missed twenty best days, it will reduce to only one hundred and eighteen percent. It means in eleven years you can make only money or double. That's it, which is not great return. And friends, if you have missed thirty best days, your return would have been negative. I give you the red forty. If you look at this, uh, uh, you know, money back. I painted it red. If you have missed just thirty base days, you know, in twelve years, twelve years means how many days? Probably seven thousand five hundred days. In seven thousand five hundred days, if I missed point five percent, just thirty days, my one crore would have become point eight two crores. I would have lost my money, and then people say equity market is not good. Friends, equity market is good market. It is a wealth creation market. You need to keep control on your emotions. You need to keep control on your behavior. Don't get worried. Think long term. Think on focusing on your financial goals and make sure that don't get bogged down by the volatility. Why invest consistently? Focus on long term is important, and this is something very, very important chart. And on the left hand side, are given last twenty years the drawdown. And on the right hand side, despite the drawdowns, what kind of returns you would have made? And friends, can you believe this number? An investor who would have invested before Lehman collapse, when market went down by fifty five percent, your hundred rupee became forty five rupees. And despite hundred became forty five, would have remained invested. It gave you ten percent compounding return till today, after losing. 55% of your money still it gave you significantly higher return than fixed deposit and if you would have invested in 2002 something very similar your cagr would have been 14% one crore would have become 15 crore despite all the drawdowns 15 times returns in 20 years tell me which other asset class can offer such returns but the key is never get the volatility don't worry about the volatility and now i come to the last part of uh, you know uh, this presentation uh, i five crore advisors way triple a what we do how do we see 2022 current calendar year or the next 12 months first we believe equity will outperform yes 
there are speed breakers war inflation commodity price interest rate fed rate high many more such things these are the known things many unknown things will also come as we go along we are not worried we believe equity as an asset class will outperform because the earnings growth is going to be much stronger second very important last 12 18 months every stock went up good stock bad stock what stock z category stock penny stock they actually went up much more than the best quality stocks definitely that trend cannot sustain so if you have invested in any tip based investment penny stocks please get out of it focus on quality stocks time has come where quality will not perform the weaker companies the weaker governance the weaker management and weaker financials and last but not least as i said in my opening remark very very important this is a 24 by 7 job active investment management is something very important no longer you can say that okay i have you for 10 years no one knows in 3 years things can change dramatically who would have thought then 5 years back we were not using zoom and today we are using zoom through this beautiful conference set up by pms bazaar 5 years back nobody thought of this but today we are doing it and therefore after 5 years we don't know what other medium we might be using to communicate with you guys so very important active investment management is something very very important be aware that there is going to be constant surprise there will be constant surprise in data points both upside and downside your portfolio should be made of the companies which are resilient to those data surprises and if they are not change them today very very important well what we do to select the stock we have a very simple but very effective stock selection approach 3m investment approach market size market share and margin of safety we buy if the size of the sector is pretty large so opportunity is hind mahasagar so it is a very large opportunity we buy only if the companies are leaders in their sectors so that if the slowdown comes our companies do not get impacted to that extent and last we buy if the valuations are in our favor what we do for risk management because as i said wealth creation is a great journey but very important is to protect the capital and how can you protect the capital so what we do we do not believe that there is anything called conviction conviction you know there are some guys who say that i am convinced on this company and i'll buy only one stock my portfolio you don't know what will be the tomorrow morning headline and if the tomorrow morning headline is negative do you know volkswagen global number one automobile company in the world one auto emission norm scam and stock was down 50% india's largest pharmaceutical company one us fdi import alert and stock was down 45% largest company in globally usa based company british petroleum one oil spill and stock was down 55% blackberry nokia both are blue chip companies 10 years back today both are bankrupt companies can you predict tomorrow let's be honest you can't predict everything you try your best but you cannot leave everything to luck and therefore diversify your portfolio that's what we do we diversify across market cap we diversify across sectors we diversify across company standard investment approach something very critical and third very very important exit strategy best don't focus on what to buy also focus equally on when to sell at all five credit advisors every day basis we do brainstorming what to sell whether our companies are as beautiful today as they were when we bought and if they are not get out of it except that even we can go wrong and we do go wrong and when we believe that we are going wrong you need to get out of it so we sell when our target prices are achieved or target valuations are achieved we sell when margin of safety is not in your favor we sell because of something else is looking better and we sell when we go wrong and we do go wrong and that's something important exit strategy is as critical as entry strategy friends people keep asking me what's your market and my answer is very simple what's your view on earnings growth if you think your earnings growth is going to be good then market will do well and if you think earnings growth is not going to do well market is not going to do well is a very simple one line answer focus on earnings growth 
And if you look at this slide for last 25 years, every time, whenever there is earnings growth, market rewarded you handsomely. And last 10 years, earnings growth is muted. So market gave you muted returns. Next four years, earnings growth is going to be double digit. And therefore, we believe that market is also going to do reasonable returns over next two to three to four years. Well, what are the key themes which we like? First, we believe that big is becoming bigger. The consolidation is happening in the sector. Just reconnecting the dot. We buy only the companies which are market leaders. So our companies are actually the biggest beneficiary of COVID crisis. They are biggest beneficiary of credit crisis. They are biggest beneficiary of supply chain crisis. And of course, they are biggest beneficiary of as and when the interest rate moves up. Why? Because the small companies are dying down. The unorganized sector is dying down. The unlisted but very small enterprises, they are dying down. There is a consolidation is happening across the different sectors. So if you look at, for example, bank credit, the top six players, there is 67% increment of market share, very high, correct? And that's true across sector, whether you take wires, whether you take cables, tiles, plywood, steel, cement, name the sector, and more and more consolidation is happening with the most important thing, and it will benefit our portfolio companies in a very big way. Second important is capital expenditure revival. We believe that last 12 years were a muted year for India as an economy, but we believe that next three to four years, the capex is going to be significantly higher. Cement industry, steel industry, they have already announced the capex. PRI announced by government is going to further accelerate this capex program. So we believe that capex is the very important team to play for next two, three, four years. China plus one is a trend, not China versus India, China plus one as a trend. I think that's going to only accelerate Yesterday, I was talking with one of the largest uh, specialty chemical company, and that company had basically received order uh, equivalent to almost four times of their revenue size uh, from one of the largest global multinational company. And uh, I was discussing with that company that how do you see the opportunities? And the company was saying that almost every week, you get a new customer inquiries. And that's true probably with many of the other companies as well, whether it's the electronics exports, whether it is a specialty chemical exports, whether it is a API related exports, whether it's a crimes related stories. So when we interact with companies, we believe that these trends have just started, uh, uh, you know, accelerating because the earlier, you know, the flights were not possible, travel was not possible, but now the foreign companies can visit India, they can visit India plant, they can meet the management and gain confidence for their China plus one strategy. What is our outlook on sector? Probably we'll, we can take it during Q&A, if there's any question on this. How we are positioned, this is our portfolio, how we are positioned, again, we can probably take as a part of Q&A. And just one slide from my side, and then I will, uh, uh, maybe two slides, and then I will hand over for uh, Q&A. If in one line you can say is that, what is our five credit advisor portfolio looks like? Well, our flagship plan is triple India opportunity PMS plan, the true multi cap, 50% large cap, 25% mid cap, 25% small cap. Very importantly, while 50% is mid cap and small cap, there is not a single company in our portfolio which is small in terms of profit side. We buy only market leaders, irrespective of the market cap. So, say for example, uh, and I'm giving a disclaimer the company which we may talk about, we might be holding for our clients uh, or in personal capacity. So, this is not a recommendation. So, for example, Century Plywood, which we own in our portfolio, is largest company in plywood, but the market cap is small cap. Say, for example, uh, the largest company in bearings, Tin Can, the company is large, number one in market share, top three companies in the world, but the market cap is small cap. Sundaram Fasteners is the largest company in India in fasteners, but market cap classification is small cap. So we don't go by market cap, we go by the market leadership, we go by the profit size, we go by the balance sheet. So all of our portfolio companies are large when it comes to profit. Most of our portfolio companies have zero leverage. So if the interest rate goes up, they are going to be biggest beneficiary because on one hand, the competitors will lose out because they will bet on the balance sheet. And on the other hand, our companies are throwing cash every year. So their other income will also start moving up, which will improve their return on net worth further. All other companies are market leaders and they are growing 
significantly higher than the benchmark indices, whether it is a Nifty or India GDP growth, with of course significantly better return on net worth. How is our performance in last 12, 12 and a half years? Our triple India opportunity PMS plan is delivered about 18.8% compounded annualized returns compared to BAC finder index returns of 12%, Nifty 11.5, Midcap 12.4, and BAC small cap 12.1. Of course, we have a custodian, HDFC Bank and Deutsche Bank and Stock Holding as our partners. Um, and of course, we received a few uh, important awards in, uh, in our journey throughout last 12 years. Uh, very recently, we got an award for the best PMS in the country by Asia Pacific Magazine publication, one of the most uh, recognized publication in the world. With that, uh, you know, I'm really thankful to you uh, for your valuable time. And uh, uh, you know, we are open for Q&A. Please feel free if you have any questions. Happy to answer. Thank you, Shivaraman. Thank you very much. Uh, Rajesh, uh, there are uh, three big learnings for the investors from your presentation. Is at first, it takes about 49 days for mitigation of any drawdown. It's the biggest learning. The second one is uh, moderate inflation is definitely not bad for the equities is the second learning. The third one is the best. And uh, the best 30 days if you miss, and you would have made negative returns. So time in the market is very important than timing is the biggest lesson we got uh, from your presentation. Let us get into the uh, Q&A, Rajesh. And in fact, uh, some uh, uh, questions have come on the uh, macros and some questions have come on the portfolio. Let me take uh, the, the, the macro questions first. The first question is, uh, uh, how do you, the sectorial outlook in uh, FI23, which sectors will perform from the current levels is what uh, the question has come. Uh, it will be the best performing sectors. Okay, best performing sector. Okay, uh, I think what is going to happen is that, you know, the GDP growth, see, last four years of India, they were impacted years. There are a lot of reforms, GST, credit crisis, RERA, many reforms. And then the COVID came. So it was a very painful time. And from this painful time, we are going to move to the better GDP growth number. So if you look at the corporate profit to GDP was touched a very, very low number of 3% compared to average corporate profit to GDP, almost 8%. Now this 3% to 8% is going to be the journey in our view for next two, three, four years. And in that journey, it is not going to be driven by only one or two sectors. Unlike 2012 to 2016 period, where at times only FMCG performed, at times only pharma performed. We believe this is the time where every sector will participate. It is like a repeat of 2003 to 2006, when Nifty went up by five times in five years. It was like 55% compounding returns, correct? I think every sector is going to participate. There are multiple levers of growth. So banking industry will do well as the GDP moves up naturally. China plus one will help many companies like specialty chemical, electronics. The CapEx story, which was a muted, I already mentioned that we believe that story will also do very well. Real estate sector has been in trouble since last 12 years. We believe the real estate is also going to revive. And revival of real estate means a lot of ancillary sectors will do well. Tiles, plywood, lights, cables, indirectly cement at some stage, and so on and so forth. China platinum will also benefit specialty pharmaceutical companies, and likewise. Sectors which were impacted very, very badly last two years in particular, like automobile, auto ancillary, those sectors will also see bounce back because they were got impacted more because of supply chain issue and less because of the demand issue. So I think in nutshell, Next, I, I would say 12 to 36 months, it is not going to be one sector focus. It is going to be multi-sector thing. And that's what even our strategy in our PMS, we diversify across sectors. We don't try to do only one sector. We try to reduce the risk. And I think life is all about superior risk adjusted returns rather than just the absolute returns. So not a single sector, I've given view on few sectors on which we are more positive. But I think it is going to be very, very broad-based market rent. 
Uh, Rajesh, which sector you is no no for you? You will never enter. Well, I think uh, you know from a portfolio perspective, we do not invest into any uh, global commodities, whether it's the oil or whether it's the metal. Uh, but instead of sector, I would say that clear no no for any investor uh, is the poor quality stocks. Uh, there are a number of companies which are coming out with an IPO. They might have checkered history. Uh, please be careful about it. There are a number of companies uh, where the profits have ballooned in last one year. Many of it is probably one off because they got huge commodity price benefit. Uh, please be aware of it. There are many companies, they look cheap on price to earning number. But if you do a little bit deep dive, you will come to know that there are some issues in governance or some issues in the balance sheet. Uh, please avoid uh, and so on and so forth. The poor quality, in fact, we did one uh, you know, exercise here uh, la last month and we were checking the performance of poor quality versus best quality. And for the first time in last four years, I've seen that poor quality is doing super returns and best quality is giving the average returns. You know, this is the gap. Now, it means that somebody is buying those poor quality stocks and unfortunately, institution participation is very low. It means retail is buying it. And they may get uh, injured badly uh, because many of these companies that do not have strong underlying fundamentals to support the valuations. So please be very careful, a clear no-no to poor governance, poor balance sheet, and poor management, and last, very important, poor growth. So at times people buy companies which looks good, a prime of which they look good, management is reasonable, balance sheet is reasonable, but the growth is missing. But the valuations are very cheap, so it's like six times price to multiple, you buy it, and for two years there is a zero growth, stock price will not go up, correct? So. These are the four things which you should keep in mind uh, before you buy any stock. Avoid such companies where uh, you know you think that the companies are not going to do well due to you know few of such reasons. Next question is the specialty chemicals is the least understood by a common investor. What is your outlook? What is your view? And you are very bullish about uh, specialty chemical in your presentation. Can you throw some light on the specialty chemical? As a segment, you are absolutely right. Uh, you know, specialty chemical is one sector uh, which we identified actually much earlier uh, than the street. Probably uh, from 2016, uh, we became bullish on specialty and we kept adding on to the weight. Um, you are also right that it is a probably a little bit complex sector for a uh, common layman to understand. In fact, uh, in the month of January, uh, we had a special webinar only on specialty chemical sector. And uh, you can see uh, the sector entire understanding, uh, how to understand the sector, how to identify the companies, how, what is our approach of identifying multi baggers in that space. We have given everything in that video and it is already there on YouTube. Uh, but to cut it short, we believe that specialty chemical runway is very, is a long runway. Please understand the China market share is 25, 30%. India market share is less than nine, 10%. Even if 2% shifts from China to India, we are fine because our, our hunger will be satisfied. We will see 30% earnings growth for the next 3, 4, 5 years. So long runway, there is a long runway ahead. India is a good talent available in the sector. And the very important part is many of the Indian specialty chemical companies, they have already proven themselves in last 5 years. They have already actually despite the products, their profile, the R&D, their to their global customer, whether it is Sumitomo's of the world, Basa for the world, Bath of the world, and many more such companies. But the sourcing from the customer was very small quantity because they were testing the capability of the Indian companies. Now, capabilities are now proven, correct? If you look at a company, for example, Navin Flory, uh, you know, uh, probably one year back or nine months back, they announced one order which is equivalent to uh, that time, you know, uh, very large compared to their revenue. So, Likewise, every company, even SRF or even you know any company in the specialty chemical, they issued such large orders. So I think the outlook is very, very bright. Yes, the valuations have moved up, but one thing which you need to be very careful when you are buying any specialty chemical company, differentiate between commodity chemical and specialty chemical. So there are many companies that themselves, you know, they call themselves specialty chemical, but actually they are not. Many of them are commodity chemicals. Avoid it because their entire profit is driven by increase in realization, increasing pricing. 
I know few chemical traders. They made money. What the kind of money they made in last twelve months is equal to last forty years. You know that kind of increasing jump in the realization they have seen. Definitely, that is not going to sustain. So avoid commodity chemical. Identify the companies which have the technology as a moat, which has the R and D as a moat, which has the innovation as a moat. The balance should be strong because you require capital expenditure and very important the environmental pollution norms. Something very very critical because if you don't meet, then you might get blacklisted from your customer. So these are the few important criteria uh, to identify the company, and we are fairly positive on this kind of a companies which have a good management, great balance sheet. Like for example, we are holding like Vinity Organics, just to give you know name of one company. Now they have sixty five percent market share in the world. You know, I was talking about the top three companies in India. I'm talking now about a company which is a 65% market share in ATPS in the world market. A debt free balance sheet, 25% return on net worth, 25% return on capital employed, huge capex plan for next two, three, four, five years. And the same is true for many of my other specialty chemical companies. So they are pretty large. They are solid backward integration. Uh, their moat is very high. If you look at, for example, companies like SRF, they look at the kind of innovation they are doing in their R&D division. Uh, and that is basically going to give the new product portfolio, new customers, uh, and deep dive into the domain like flooring chemistry. Correct? The flooring chemistry is completely different. Uh, it's not everyone's cup of tea. In India, there are only three companies in flooring based chemistry. It's extremely complex. It's not easy. There are chemistry which are hazardous. I mean, it's not everyone's cup of tea. If there's a one fire, the entire plant will blow up. Yeah. So I think it's a very complex thing, but you need to understand it and. Invest wisely uh, after putting such investment. The, the, the private capex is still behind us, but government is definitely increasing its capex. And uh, having this in mind, what is your outlook on the capital uh, growth sector? You are absolutely right. I think uh, 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 you know, last twelve years, if you look at the capex side, is a missing link in India. Everything was doing well, but Capital expenditure is a missing link. In the last four years, government is trying its best to uh, do the road construction, ports, railways, and large mega projects. But the private sector capex is missing. Now, what is going to be have from here on? That's something important. Three things. First, the commodity prices have gone up significantly. In a way, it is a good news for capex sector because still, oil and gas and cement, the metal, oil and gas, and cement. Are three most important sector when it comes to capital expenditure. If you look at the announcements by the plants by most of the top five companies in this sector, whether it's steel, cement, and oil and gas, they have already announced their capex program, which is almost two times more than what they have spent in last five years. I repeat, their capex program announcement is almost double in next three four years compared to last five years. Second very important thing is the PLI by government. That itself can probably generate 1.6 percent to the GDP. It can add 1.6 percent to GDP. Almost 4 lakh crore can be planned target PLI across different sectors. And we are receiving extremely good response on PLI thing across sectors, whether it's the electronics, whether it's the pharmaceuticals, whether it's the chemical, and many more such things. And therefore, what is going to happen is when it comes to stock selection. We are no more buying the companies of 2003, 2006. You know those famous companies of construction and EPC. We are avoiding. I think the winning winning strategy is to buy the companies which are not dependent on one sector. But there are many sectors which are many companies which are doing automation. There are many companies which are doing the process efficiency because of COVID, because of brownfield and so on and so forth. They may not do greenfield. The greenfield is done by only cement, steel, and oil and gas. But across the industry, whether it is a food, whether it is a chemical, whether it is automobile, everybody is doing process automation. So we are buying the companies which is a technology as a moat, which is a R and D as a moat. And these companies, they are a global multinational companies, Indian listed subsidiaries, and these companies are very well positioned to not only drive the capex program beneficiary, but they are also the biggest drivers of growth to implement the automation at the plant levels. Yeah. So yesterday I was uh, discussing with one of the conference, uh, and ABB, uh, you know, managing director was there, and he was saying that 
in india by doing the process automation how one can achieve 25 to 30% cost savings now that's a huge savings for any indian entrepreneur earlier there was a concept that if i am a small enterprise automation is not for me robotics is not for me but gone are those days now even a small enterprise can have automation to the extent possible because labor is still cheap in india compared to italy and compared to spain so you need a right combination of labor and the automation and the robotics and that's how you need to implement the strategy to give an example ab implemented one of the not one of the the longest conveyor belt for steel company in karnataka this is the longest conveyor belt in the probably entire world and it has saved 3000 trips otherwise which truck has to do the you know the mineral transfer the ore transfer from the mine to the plant 3000 trips every year so they have implemented not only the process efficiency but it is a green solution it is a sustainable solution and it is a that kind of a solution which is going to drive the company's earnings growth the order book growth and more profitability unlike the traditional epc company or construction company Rajesh uh, Chinmay Thakkar is asking this question. He is congratulating you for the, a wonderful and insightful presentation, and he wants to know what is your view on the market disturb uh, disturbers, and what is your PMS do uh, the hyperscalers market uh, disturbers, and this kind of stocks you carry in your PMS is what uh, Chinmay Thakkar wants to know. Okay. Uh correct me if i am wrong if i understand question right i think he is talking about the uh, you know the new uh, you know new businesses the uh, companies which are coming out as an ipo into the new technology field kind of thing perhaps uh, yes right uh, perfect yes. so you know what i believe is that uh, that this kind of a companies which is a new which are new age company these new age companies one should not ignore and at the same time one should not blindly buy them okay Three important things. What one needs to evaluate. Number one, what is the market share of this company? Whether the market is already settled or market is yet to evolve. Let me give you one example. If it is the e-pharmacy space, there are ten companies in e-pharmacy space. Avoid the space. The leadership is not yet emerged clearly. Tata is also playing. Reliance is also playing. Three other companies are also playing. Two other traditional companies also wants to play. Is it today ten players market? It is not a two players market. Correct. Compared to that sector, where there are only two players, it means at least industry has evolved. There can be a risk. Third player can always come, which is fine. But from ten, it has become two. We like on a relative basis, it is better proposal. Number one. Second, very important. What is the promoter's skin in the game? In most of these IPOs, most of these new age companies, the promoter stake is less than ten percent. So who is Taking the the shots are taken by the private equity funds. We don't know whether they exit to private equity fund at their valuation. Definitely, they will try their best. It's their job, and it is our job to make sure that we don't fall into the trap. So, promoter stake is very important. If the promoter stake is thirty percent, forty percent, fifty percent, sixty percent, that's something which is minimum we prefer. Third, very important. The company is it a profitable or is it a loss making? Ninety-five percent of these companies are loss making. Will they turn into profit making or loss making? Not too sure. Avoid. Four very important. This company's birth is due to the disruption, and therefore this company can also get disrupted. It is just like how you disrupted others in three years. Somebody can disrupt you as well in the next three years. So, do you have the right R and D? Do you have the right innovation? Do you have the right talent? Do you have the right scale to make sure that before somebody disturbs you, you disturb somebody else? So, these companies are, can be disrupted in a matter of probably three months, six months, nine months. It's very easy. So, a company which is listed, you know, yesterday I was talking with one of my US friends, and I don't know how many of probably you might be knowing a company called DoorDash. Yeah, it is a delivery platform company in US. And DoorDash is now doing business, you know, of even the grocery delivery. And there is another company which is also doing the software solution provided to the grocery companies. So these companies which are getting listed, they are now getting pressure from the minority shareholders. But their competitors are private equity backed 
venture capital kind of reforms, which are still not listed, and there's no money to burn. So you are now sandwiched between the two. On one end, you have the Amazon kind of the players who are ready to disrupt you. On the other end, you have a private equity back, not yet listed for which is a money to burn. And if you are listed entity, you are between these two. Their the future may not be that bright for you. So we evaluate every company with open mind because it is important to keep evaluating on open mind. But at the same time, invest very very selectively. And we believe in diversification. So we take risk adjusted approach. We take a very measured approach. Even if we like it, we may buy maybe only one percent of the portfolio. We'll wait because these promoters they don't have experience of a listed equity space. Their mindsets are completely different. You need to see that what is their behavior, how they basically handle the minority shareholders, and if we gain that confidence over the next two, three, four years, then we may increase the weightage from one percent to two percent or something like that. That's approach, a uh, very very measured approach, conscious approach, uh, and at the same time flexible approach. Probably is a prudent way to keep delivering uh, superior risk adjusted returns. Definitely, and public and private markets are two different ball games, as you rightly said. And uh, uh, you know, public market punishes you very, very hard, and they don't have waiting time like uh, private people, uh, as you rightly said. Okay, I'll get into the next question. This is from Vivek. He is asking. I read out this question, Rajesh. You said moderate inflation is okay for earning, but as I understand, in a limited way, is it good? If inflation is demand trigger, current inflation is also largely supply disruptions driven. Do you feel? What do you feel about the same? Very good question. Very interesting question. Uh, I think uh, he is absolutely right. Uh, 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 most part of the inflation currently is supply driven inflation. Some part is also demand driven because U.S. economy has seen the significant rebound in the underlying demand as well. So I would not say that everything is supply driven, but on one end there is a urgent, what I would say, sudden supply is positive demand recovery, and at the same time, a supply disruption also started happening. So cumulative of these two resulted in spike in inflation, and therefore I'm a little bit more relaxed. Had it been 100% driven by demand, then it needs to be cooled off in one or other way. But it is not 100% driven by demand; it is actually driven by supply. And supply can be always can be resolved because it is not that that you know particular freight route or particular container will not be available for next three years. Not possible. Fine. It is more due to lockdown. Once the lockdown gets over, you will get the container. So it is not that genuine inflation. It is not that high genuine inflation. Good part of it is driven by supply chain issues. Supply chain issues. Cannot be permanent in nature, at least in my view, because war cannot continue for lifetime. The lockdowns cannot continue for lifetime. And as those restrictions get over, the supply increases. And as the supply increases, the inflation reduces. And as the inflation reduces from the spike, if you reduce to a little bit more sober level, it will further pull the demand, and that's the best environment for the. Corporate earnings growth. The next question is: India is going digital in a rapid way. What is your view, and how to play the safe for the advantage of the portfolio? In turn, will result in the returns. Again, very interesting question. I think uh, uh, you know uh, I was uh, uh, last week we were reading the uh, you know Microsoft uh, transcript, and uh, he was saying that. Uh, data, which is five percent of the world, is going to become ten percent of the world, uh, and uh, you know, and so on and so forth. So, digital is everywhere. The way in which we entertain ourselves, the way in which we do business conferences, the way in which we, uh, you know, probably our kids are learning, and across the aspect. In fact, if you look at India, the digital economy is roughly about six seven percent of the Indian economy, and that is going to become almost like fifteen to twenty percent over the next four years. What I'm trying to say that we have now two types of economy. One is a traditional economy, which is growing at a natural five six percent GDP growth, and then even digital economy, which is growing at a eighteen twenty percent growth. So clearly, the companies 
which are going to participate in this new economy, correct? With the right balance sheet and so on and so forth, definitely will deliver superior earnings growth. What we do to make sure that we participate in this strategy? The two things. There is a myth that digital means only software companies. Digital means only technology companies. No, digital is everywhere. In the banking industry, also digital is important. For pharmaceutical companies, also digital is important. For ABB, also the digital is important. Digital is just a platform. Digital is just a medium to make sure that your cost efficiency improves and you give the better customer experience. So what we do is internally for every company in our portfolio, we keep checking what is the digital resilience. Let's say for example, we are holding ICCA Bank. Definitely, they are forefront of changing technology compared to any other private sector bank in the country, correct? And therefore, they are disrupting many other fintechs. They are beneficiary of digitalization. Bajaj Finance, one of our portfolio companies we are holding for the last six, seven, eight years, they were always digital company from day one. Two minutes approval, on the spot approval, was the USP of the company before eight years. ADB, as I said, has implemented completely robotic, smart grid, and many more such things. And likewise. So we believe that there is a very good way to identify the beneficiary of digitalization in the existing listed, the top 100 companies in India itself. And that advantage, because they have a cash flow, they can keep reinvesting into that business and they will keep competitor at a significant distance and that will further help them to gain the market share. Also, uh, just for the benefit of viewers, we also offer start, uh, you know, our offering uh, on our advisory platform, uh, triple and next generation opportunity in triple digital India portfolio. But that's of course on the, uh, you know, advisory platform. Uh, the, you know, it is not on PNS platform. So this is the answer. So digital is going to be definitely uh, in the structural, secular theme. And before you buy any company, listed or unlisted anywhere, make sure that company is resilient when it comes to digital. Otherwise, the company might get disrupted by anyone. So that's how we look at uh, the digital space. See, a lot of other questions are also coming. And the last question to you, uh, Rajesh, and a very interesting question. And in fact, the Fed balance sheet is about 9 trillion. And if the Fed increases the rate, still the liquidity will be abundant. And uh, this is what uh, an investor wants to know. And it won't suck the liquidity as we fear, it's what he wants to know. What is your input on this? Well, I think, you know, over a period of time, uh, Shivaraman, what I've understood is uh, beyond a point, don't try to do over research on economy because there are so many data points. Uh, Japanese balance sheet, US balance sheet, Europe balance sheet, China balance sheet, US balance sheet, and they keep doing the financial juggling. You know, it's a complete financial engineering. And you actually never understand from where liquidity is coming and where it is going up because they will take out from one section and then they will infuse somewhere else. So, beyond the point, I think what is important is that focus on fundamentals, focus on earnings. Sorry, I, you know, I'm not trying to avoid the question, but there are no straight answers. And these debates continue. At times, what happens? Because the debate continues, you start becoming, okay, should I buy or should I not? Ultimately, what you need to take decide that the, if you want to buy company A, whether the company A will do earnings growth better than the economy? Simple question. I always say finance is very simple. People believe investments are very complex. I don't think so. I think it's simplest thing in the life. Investments are simplest thing in the life. Keep it simple. Don't complicate it. Ask only one question. Do you think the company in which you want to make investment, whether it is a potential to grow its earning by 15 to 20% for next three years? I'm not asking 30 years, just three years. If the answer to that question is yes, okay, I don't want to time it, you buy it today. Of course, subject to good governance, good management, and of course, all right tick boxes are ticked. Of course, then only you go ahead. Keep it very simple because this Fed will come, Russia will come, Ukraine will come, Middle East come, in between North Korea will come from somewhere, the US guy will do some announcement, India will do some testing, state government elections will happen, central government elections will happen, US elections will happen, in all that stuff. If your company delivers at 15-20% earnings growth, there is no way 
then you can underperform any other asset class and you will create huge value in the long term. Rajesh, I enjoyed it thoroughly. I, I hope uh, all the participants must have felt the same way. We got a very good learning from this uh, presentation. I would like to thank you and the participant for this. There are some questions still, it keeps coming. We will send it across to you and uh, please answer them so that uh, we go back to them and uh, we will send across your answers to them. Thank you very much for the insightful uh, session, Rajesh. Thank, thank you, you very friends. much. Thank I you thank the participants also. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, friends, for your valuable time. Thank you, PMS Bazaar. Thank you, Shivaraman, for the wonderful job. Uh, Pleasure is mine. Pleasure is mine. Thanks, Rajesh. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.